is Brian Danforth, a well-known figure in colonial numismatics. He's written numerous articles on a variety of colonial topics, and his recently focused researches have been on the St. Patrick's coinage, uh, making a number of interesting discoveries. He presented a, an outstanding paper in the Coinage of the Americas conference a couple of years ago, which will be out in print, we hope, very soon, and has made continuing contributions ever since that time. And he is currently working on a book on copper coinages that circulated in colonial America in the whole broad period. And Dr. Brian Danforth. Um, I may have been the fur coming the furthest uh, f for today's presentation. I primarily live in Thailand, so I have a little bit of jet lag. To me, this is exactly almost 2 o'clock in the morning, and uh, I'm not quite a potty animal, so I have to bear with a little bit of time lag. Uh, my primary interest uh, started off uh, in research, actually, with Woods Coinage. Um, I love the controversy that surrounds the man and the history of Ireland at the time and the history of, of numismatics at the period. And while I was doing uh, some research on that, I, a little door opened up in terms of St. Patrick's. It just came across and one of those things, I stopped what I was doing uh, for that particular paper on Woods coinage and got sidetracked, which happens sometimes in history and people doing research. And one thing led to another, and I started to get very confused, as many other numismatics, numism, yeah, time lag, um, have gotten confused as to when these coins were uh, minted, who, who minted them, and what they were all about. And it dawned on me, um, what started to strike me, or what the little tangent was that was grabbing my attention, uh, was the edge on uh, the St. Patrick coins, um, that milled edge and um, talking with a friend of mine in archaeology, he said, well, why don't you look at what you're doing and why don't you approach it as an archaeologist would? There's a certain technology involved that put that edge in the coin, and by dating the technology or approaching the subject from that approach, maybe you can start to uh, find out when the coins uh, were minted. And that basically uh, opened up a whole door to research that took me uh, over to Ireland and took me uh, to the libraries in, in England and I ended up with a publication um, in the Colonial Newsletter in 2002 on the St. Patrick uh, Coinage, which was my uh, first publication uh, on the topic. Um, it's a very fascinating series, my own particular premise, and one of the things that's been interesting that has happened since that publication is that uh, a lot of other people have started to look at the series from their own perspective. Um, and that has brought even more commentary in. And our understanding of the St. Patrick series is growing as a result of that. And whether my presentation or my uh, approach or theory to um, the St. Patrick uh, theories will end up being the correct one or not, who knows? But what's fascinating about it is a door has opened in terms of research into the field, and our knowledge of the St. Patrick series has greatly expanded in the past couple of years, uh, which certainly, uh, if someone had talked about the edge of a St. Patrick coins and its technology 10 years ago, they would say, why? Are you even, I mean, what, is, what are you talking about? So it's certainly um, been interesting from that perspective. Um, I took my approach for the presentation today really focusing on the two main, what I view as the two main characters or the two main people involved in producing the St. Patrick coins, and that was uh, Lord Orman and uh, Pierre, whose name was anglicized, Peter Blondeau. And taking the premise that the coins were minted based on the technology that was introduced by Peter Blondeau, um, that the coins, uh, the mintage date is somewhere between 1667, uh, 1669. The latter part of Ornman's uh, administration as Lord Lieutenant uh, for Ireland, which is also a period of financial crisis for the kingdom, 
um, which in which uh, the kingdom was, it was at the end of a war that England was involved with. Um, Ireland had a lot of problems financially, had a lot of problems with it, and a very dissatisfied army, and had a great problem with uh, it, its money that not only that it lacked generally, but also just a small change that uh, was absent to a large degree in circulation. And the technology that um, Blondeau had uh, introduced, and this is also open to uh, debate, which is another interesting thing, um, but Blondeau talked about it as a one-stroke uh, technology of striking the coins, both on uh, the obverse and the reverse, and on the edge all at one time. And that bit of information, uh, there's a lot of uh, discussion about. But it's, again, it's interesting because these are things that we never would have discussed uh, four years ago or, or 10 years ago. Orman himself um, comes from um, uh, a long line uh, of uh, involvement in Irish history. It starts with Theodore uh, Butler, who came to Ireland in 1185 as part of Prince John's army to put down a rebellious uh, <clears throat> Irish um, nobles who had taken it upon themselves to really view their own principalities as somewhat separate from uh, the King of England. And James, the uh, fifth son of uh, Chief Butler, the Theobald, due to his involvement with uh, Prince John, was elevated to a chiefdom in Ireland. Um, he married the granddaughter of Edward I, and as a result of that marriage, Edward III uh, granted him in the title of Earl and also granted him the uh, County Palatine of Tipperary. Um, and that's kind of important as a backdrop because of the certain rights that are involved uh, with that, one of which is the rights of coinage. Um, the, but the Butler family had a long to, uh, involvement in Irish affairs, uh, coming down to the 12th Earl, uh, who was the subject for St. Patrick coinage. And the 12th Earl, um, was, he, he was the commander of the Irish royal forces under Charles I. Um, he basically experienced what it was like uh, not to have enough money to pay troops. He experienced personally the problems of, a, of an army that wouldn't follow direction because there wasn't enough money to pay them, and an army that, at, whose loyalty at times uh, was highly questionable due to uh, financial constraints that he experienced as the head of the, um, the Irish Army, the Royal Irish Army at the time. Um, eventually, um, he was uh, defeated by the uh, Cromwell's forces in 1651, and he joined the king in exile, or uh, the future king, uh, Charles II, in exile in Paris. And the king at that time uh, resided when he was in Paris at the Louvre. And that's an important connection, which I'll get to in a moment. In 1660, the monarchy uh, was restored, and um, Ormond returned uh, to uh, London, and the grateful king elevated him to uh, being a duke. Um, he also uh, restored to him his palatine rights, which is something that the Ormond family considered very important. They had had these rights taken from them uh, in the past and always had advocated their return and had gotten their return to them. Um, he was also appointed uh, the king's chief representative in Ireland as Lord Lieutenant of Ireland in 1662 and embarked upon um, be, uh, taking up his position in Dublin that year, only to come to an island that basically had been laid waste by a rather destructive civil war in which the Cromwell armies had laid waste the country. Um, Ireland was basically bankrupt. Um, it was, um, the army was basically less than loyal, a lot of holdovers from the Cromwell period. Um, there was lack of funds. Uh, England itself had its own problems financially because of the civil war. Uh, Cromwell, the end of the, of the Cromwell period, England was basically bankrupt. Um, so, when Ormond came to Ireland, um, he 
embarked upon an attempt basically to uh, increase revenues uh, in the country. He also had to address uh, an army um, that was not very loyal and an army that wasn't being paid or was being underpaid. Initially, he advanced personal funds in 1662 to try to stay any disruptions. Uh, unfortunately, he wasn't always successful. Uh, there were mutinies, uh, there were rebellions, which he had to put down. Um, and those were generally around uh, the issue of lack of funds, the army not being paid. In 1660, the monies that were available uh, in Ireland to a large degree were, it was a mixture of, I mean, Ireland uh, was a dependency, or viewed as a dependency of England, and its money to a large degree uh, was also um, a cast off from England. Uh, they had the monies that were made or issued, uh, minted from the Civil War period. Um, the estimate at the time was that um, most of the English money in circulation was outdated. It was, they viewed it as the cast off coins from England. Um, the estimate was that only 10% of the actual money in circulation would be viewed as good English money. Um, the average weight reduction from clipping um, uh, the, of the coins was 20% below uh, what would be considered fair weight uh, for English coins. Um, and the other problem um, that they had was that Charles II had ordered that uh, Cornwell's money would be demonetized um, in, in 1662. It would no longer be accepted by the crown as, as official uh, money. And um, the primary crisis uh, that uh, Ormond faced, uh, by 1667, the winter of 1666-1667 had deteriorated to the point uh, where the army and overall um, basically uh, was had an overall arrearage of seven months. And for some units, it was well over a year they hadn't received funds. And this was a, a problem as the winter approached because he didn't have money to house uh, the troops. Uh, and what he did was he authorized or enforced uh, private uh, residences to take up and house uh, soldiers. And he put them in private ends. Um, his opponents viewed this as an illegal act, even though he had consulted uh, attorneys and uh, who assured him that what he was doing was legal. But in personal correspondence to uh, his son, he outlined that basically what he had done uh, was highly questionable in terms of the legality of it. And what his uh, fear was that his opponents would use this as one cause to basically get him out uh, of Ireland because there were people who uh, were opposed to his administration. Um, in his commentary, uh, he, he commented that, e and this is a quote, either the king must, by raising the pay of the soldiers to enable them to pay for lodgings, or they must house them free, or there must be no army. And his commentary that there must be no army was basic, a realization that that, well, m may be an option. It wasn't a very realistic option. Uh, at that particular time, uh, there had been an army amassing in, Bre in Brest in France, uh, uh, put together by, uh, by the Dutch and the French, and the thought was that Ireland was going to be invaded. And the army certainly had to be depended upon. And at the same time, uh, the army wasn't being properly housed, and soldiers were breaking into private homes in Dublin. Um, and they were taking possessions of ordinary people and saying, this is our pay. We're entitled to payment. We're not getting it, so we're taking it. Um, and they were forcing themselves into homes uh, to establish a residence uh, during uh, the winter months. And at this particular time, um, a couple of things start to happen in early 1667. Uh, one is that uh, Ormond, who had basically lost or uh, had endured uh, financial setbacks during the Commonwealth period, as a lot of royalists did, but him in particular, since he was the leader of the Royal uh, Irish Army, um, he was compensated. Uh, by a commission that had been established by the king to look into uh, who in Ireland uh, was entitled to uh, being reimbursed for the losses that they had endured. And he received 50,000 uh, pounds 
uh, during the early part of 1667. And also at that time, uh, a few months later, he um, makes the famous request, which is in the literature, of requesting, initially the request is for 50,000 uh, pounds be sent from England to pay for the army. And that was because of what he perceived as this mounting uh, potential invasion force from France. Um, but by the summer, he realized that that wasn't going to occur, that there was, was talk of peace, so he reduced his request to 30,000 pounds and farthings, which is a statement that is, appears in the literature as connected to trying to win to date the St. Patrick coinage. And I've actually come across the correspondence which was made, which is very insightful as to his involvement, why I believe, and further evidence for his involvement and the mentage of the St. Patrick series. And the, the quote is, we find that the king is in no greater debt to the army than he can soon pay. I am to propose that we have 30,000 pounds in milled brass or copper farthing sent us, or the metal sent in workmen and tools to coin them. But if it met with no rub on that side, London, on notice, I shall have it more particularly proposed and reduced to method and practice myself. So in effect, he's saying is if London can't give me the money, I'll make it. I'll have to satisfy the needs of the army. And one of the commentators at the period uh, commenting upon that particular approach said, quote, small money is a private one which the Lord Lieutenant might order by his own instructions. Now, the involved in, at this juncture in which Orman is trying to figure out how he's going to meet military obligations. Um, he's also aware of what's happened, and I don't, he's aware whether there's a direct connection, I don't know, Lou Jordan's in the audience, I'm gonna point, I'll allude to one of those connections. Um, there were two coinages going on in the colonies that uh, set precedents of money that's created out of immediate need, either for economic development or money or necessity. One is in, in Maryland, and the other is in Massachusetts. And Orman um, serves, he's a courtier of the period. He serves on various uh, royal commissions, and he's very aware of what happens in the colonies. And in particular, there's two, col there's two areas in which he's particularly interested in or involved in. One of them is Maryland. He serves on um, an advisor to the king in terms of uh, the cultivation of tobacco and uh, royal duties on tobacco in, in reference to Maryland and Virginia. He also sets, sits on the commission that resolves the border dispute between Virginia and Maryland, all in this time period. In terms of New England, he sits on the council that basically is uh, funding missionary work uh, throughout New England um, in terms of uh, dealing with the Indians in New England being a theocracy. Um, he's very much involved um, with what is occurring in New England financially since they are supporting missionary work. And most importantly, in 1662, he's appointed as a courtier to a royal commission which is in charge for the framing of letters, proclamations, or orders for the king's signature pertaining to, the, to all the colonies at large. So he's a very knowledgeable person of colonial affairs, and I have not personally discovered uh, any information that connects him directly to the coinage of either Massachusetts or of Maryland. But at this time in which um, Orman is returning from 19, uh, excuse me, 19, yeah, 16, 16 I'm just a few, dec a few decades older, uh, from 1660 to 1667, um, the coinage of both Maryland and Massachusetts is an issue that is, does come to the attention of royal officials, and he certainly is aware of the issues that surround the coinage of, 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 of Maryland and Massachusetts. Although Massachusetts, in terms of being a problematic issue for the, uh, for the royal advisors, isn't until the 1670s. The, um, just to digress a little bit on um, the county um, Palatine issue, 
um, that is granted to the family. Um, time of William the First, there were 70 mints in, in, in England. Um, and these are reduced by the time of Edward III, who grants the, the, uh, the rights of, of mintage under the County Palatine um, to the family, uh, reduced to just uh, two royal mints and two ecclesiastical mints, which is then expanded uh, by Ed Edward III because he's engaged in expanding commerce for England at large. And he creates an additional um, royal mint in, and at Calais, and he uh, creates two additional ecclesiastical mints. And these, that what's important about these um, minor, um, the right to coin, um, is it really a right that's generally given only to earls in England and Ireland. It's granted only to those primarily who serve an important role either along the Scottish or the Welsh border. The role was really to um, protect uh, England, and they were given inordinate or more rights than other earls had normally been given. And the right that had been given to the Ormond family was also with that right of also trying. It was on the cutting edge between the English and the Irish rule in Ireland in the 14th century. Um, by the time of um, the 17, 1600s, 17th century, Ormond is the last of the Irish earls, uh, great Irish earls, who still retains a Palatine right to coin money. Whether this plays into his thinking, um, I, I've looked through his papers to the extent that, that some of them are available, and I have not found a direct connection, but the right uh, was something that was very important to him. It was something that he fought for, his family had fought for uh, throughout the 1600s to maintain, and it was something that he asked Ch uh, King Charles II to restore to the family uh, when the monarchy was restored. So to some extent, you have a person in charge of Ireland at a critical point in its history in the 1660s, and he's facing a problem of how to finance uh, an army and how to protect the nation from a possible invasion. And this, and he's not getting financial assistance uh, from England, and at the same time, he's basically saying, if you're not going to send me the money, well, then I'll, I'll address it myself. And it is going to cost him some money, and in 1667, he receives from England some money. It, it is, does cost a certain uh, outlay of funds to establish a new coinage. And the Blondos part of it, um, is interesting because of uh, Blondeau himself is an in a minting engineer. His, um, my first awareness of his career is that he was involved in, in metal making in Italy. He's brought to Paris um, sometime prior to 1642 and participates in the modernization of minting operations in uh, and the recoining and the milling of French money in the 1640s. And in the 1640s, it starts uh, minting operations in France are divided into two components at the time. Um, the Louvre was the uh, mint, which is where the king resided in Ormond, visited the king many times uh, at the Louvre, was really focused on a more modern facility using screw presses uh, that made metals and the Paris Mint, which is made coins. Uh, they're two separate op uh, operations which merged under the administration in 1640 under a, uh, Mr. Warren, who was an experienced medalist. Um, and he is the uh, one who starts to take a different approach to the making of metals in France. He introduces a heavier screw press uh, prior to his administration, a lot of metals were done by cast molding, and he starts to put a, a raised brim along the edge of metals, uh, again using a heavy screw press. Um, and that becomes important because of the technology that Blondeau claims that he invents. In 1649, um, Blondeau is, a, is an employee at uh, the Paris Mint as an engineer, as a minting engineer, 
and he, it comes to his attention that the Commonwealth of England is going to back upon creating a new coinage. And he writes to the Council of State, introducing himself and sending specimens of new milled coins, requesting that he be hired by England to undertake the minting of their coins. How am I doing on time? Um, his recommendation um, that uh, came was it's a, in the documents, respecting some models for coins of a curious in new form, the invention of Peter Blondeau, who had a fair report of his ability and was well assured by several men well experienced in the Paris Mint that he is one of the ablest of his age in the art and the only man that can do it with as much diligence and facility as is done by the ordinary mill. Cardinal Richelieu, who drew him from Italy and gave him his dwelling here in the gallery of the Louvre and where none but men of extraordinary art and skill are lodged, and he had certainly had the direction of all the coining of France. As for his life and carriage, he is a very honest and ingenious man to whom all trust can be given in anything he undertakes. I can see no cause why any difficulty should be made in using him, nor can there happen to the state but a great and glorious advantage by his propositions. What Blondo was proposing was that the, co the new coins that England was uh, going to embark on minting be done um, by mill versus by a hammer struck process. And he, there are I'll give you three instances in which he explains the his new technology, which is basically a one-stroke technology. Um, quote, a new invention not yet prescribed in any state of the world and which will prevent counterfeiting, casting, washing, and clipping, and will cost no more than the ordinary unequal coin by making the coin not only on both the flat sides, but also upon the thickness of the edges, that it cannot be so counterfeited. And another pamphlet that he published, uh, the engines wherein with, uh, wherewith the brims are marked may be kept secret among few men who shall be sworn to keep it and not to reveal it to any. The engines that are used therein are so big and heavy, between one and 2,000 pound weight, they were put to mark all the edges at one stroke, as in the said Blondeau's invention. It is impossible to do it without strong and heavy engines. The money coined merely at the mill can be made with very small engines, but that which is proposed by the said Blondeau cannot be coined with a great uh, without a great many big and heavy engines. And a final quote, he makes a distinction between his technology and the two other existing technologies at the time that were known in terms of how to put an edge on a coin. And he makes a clear distinction accordingly. I could, in several ways, make the new extraordinary coin marked with letters at the circumference upon the thickness of the brim. The first way is ancient, being a reference to parallel bars, uh, and the segmented collar method, which is another, uh, an older method from the 1500s used in metal making. Um, and may be known to several, but it is long in doing and cannot be used upon the ordinary coin that is thin. I can do it in my particular invention, and no man but I can do it. What he was, what he was outlining was that his invention was distinct from any other process of put edging coin in that he could do it on thin coins, and that's a very important distinction because the use of parallel bars and the segmented collar approach at the time was applicable to thick coins. It wouldn't work on a thin coin such as on, on a copper, and that it could be done econ economically. Uh, a state might, a mint might be willing to expend extra funds on a gold coin or on a silver coin to go through the extra process of lettering a coin, but on a copper it wouldn't be as economical or would not make the project, a feasible project economically to go through a multi-stage process. And he was proposing that he was able to do this on a thin coin and to do it economically, the two hallmarks uh, that were necessary, especially in regard to coppers. So, Blondo goes through a particular difficult period in the 1650s, 
He's never really given the opportunity um, to become a Mint employee, um, although he does do some, a number of uh, limited quantity of coins during the Commonwealth er era. He does come to the particular attention of all, Oliver Cromwell, who uh, finds him an extraordinary engineer in, in an order under a threat, Bondo threatened he was going to leave uh, England. He sends him off to Dublin for almost two years to explore the possibility of reestablishing the Dublin Mint. He then returns to England and embarks upon a somewhat modification of the London Mint, but at the time Cromwell dies, the, basically the talk of restoration of the monarchy begins, which does lead to Bondo returning to um, France, the restoration of the monarchy uh, follows in 1660, and Charles II, when he uh, decides to issue his own coins, embarks upon the coins being hammered struck. At the same time, the coins are being heavily clipped and counterfeited, which was a problem that existed before. It was what had led the, French, uh, the Paris men to modernize, and uh, Blondeau was asked to return to England, which he did, which he does. Um, there's two different dates, whether it's the December of, of 61 or January 1662, depending upon who, which source you quote, including the original documents. Um, he comes back uh, to England. He receives a patent, um, which grants him um, exclusivity to the use of technology of edging coins. And also, that's for silver and bullion coins, which is the Charles II um, coinage. And he's also given one in terms of uh, coppers. Uh, the one for bullion coins, bullion coins is for 21 years. A coppers is for 14 years. Uh, he acquires in 1664 five screw presses he, he, uh, from Poland. Um, undoubtedly, he's, he's engaging, as settlement employees do, he's engaging in token manufacturing. Uh, for many of the merchant tokens and town tokens that are being uh, so prolifically made throughout England uh, and, and Ireland at the time. Um, in 67, um, Ormond goes, look, I believe, makes a connection with uh, Blondo. Uh, if if uh, Ormond wants to have milled coins, and then more particularly if he wants to have milled coins that have a grained edge. Uh, given the royal patent that protects uh, Blondeau, he has to turn towards uh, London. He has to turn towards um, Blondeau, and particularly as the engineer uh, for the production of his coins. But Blondeau is not the only person involved in this. There are other key players who uh, are working with Blondeau for the most part, there, there are employees uh, at the London Mint. Um, and a type of partnership is formed between these individuals. And one of them is a Henry Slingsby, who by 1667 is the chief administrator of uh, the London Mint. He's also a person who had a private interest in undertaking a uh, copper coinage for Ireland. Uh, he had requested and had sought a patent to do so. Um, he also had the ability to prevent any production of uh, coins outside of uh, the London Mint. There are other, um, there is another engineer who uh, works with uh, Blondeau, and, and this is gleaned from his will. Blondeau dies in 1672, and in his will he bequeaths the patent, um, his equipment, and all the rights that he has to several individuals who have certain responsibilities. And in that um, will, one of the important things, one of the important stipulations is that uh, Slingsby himself, um, in order to in enjoy his inheritance, has to pay the cost for engraving the rings for edge making. And that, again, is back to Blondeau's technology of how he produced, how he was able to produce his coins uh, economically on thin planchets, which is basically taking a thin metal strip and that lined the collar um, and was able to produce the grainy on, on the St. Patrick coins. So you, um, my focus is on uh, more on the two individuals uh, today. Um, 
than, than more than on the technology, but it is a merging of all these historical events uh, during the 1660s uh, at a crisis in Irish history, at a critical time where his lordship needed to find an, a, some way to pay an army. Um, and his approach, as he told London, was either you give me the money or I'll do it myself. And my premise is that basically he embarked upon doing it himself in some kind of an arrangement of, uh, with, to with a token maker, Londo, who used his invention uh, to create the St. Patrick uh, series as depicted by his own invention, on, which is shown on, on the grain on the coins. Thank you. <laughs> Are there any questions? Yes. If Lord Ormond had granted Mr. Fort's petition to mm -hmm. strike uh, tokens or coins of whatever kind they were, would that have violated any right that Mr. Blondeau had? Um, Blondeau, uh, by his royal patent of 1662, um, no coins in Ireland or England were ever produced uh, without his technology uh, in the 1660s and 1670s. During the, his, his patent uh, controlled the technology of uh, edging coins uh, during that time period. So. That the coins, not necessarily the tokens. But he does have a patent for 14 years that applies to coppers. Yes, the the coin is the applic the patent sp specifies coins coppers that are uh, employing his technology uh, on edging. Yes. When, when were these? Uh, when was the last time before this? When one of these earls had gone forward with his right to coin money? When previous? When what other earls or what, what was the? What time period were the last of these local coinages? Um, the, in Ireland, the only uh, earl that ever produced uh, money uh, uh, was the Earl of, of, of Ulster um, in the, around 1200. There's a little time spread around 1190s through uh, 120345. Um, he he's the only one in Ireland that actually produced uh, coins. Um, there are a uh, couple of uh, earls in Ireland that uh, were involved in using their privileges. Um, but it was an infrequent, something that was done infrequently. I uh, thank you.